Portage Memories is a partnership of the Wisconsin Historical Society and Wisconsin Public Television. On a damp December night, the people of Portage venture downtown to an event called Living Windows. Shops on the historic streets free up window space to put a bit of Portage history on display. Taking pride in the past and in famous Portage area residents is a local tradition that goes way back. Built on the land between two rivers on an ancient Native American footpath, Portage was present at the beginning of Wisconsin history, and in many ways, Portage's story is Wisconsin's story. Today, Portage is a place where the present blends with the vanished past, and the people of Portage continue to find ways to treasure their history to keep their hometown memories alive. In Portage, Wisconsin, the signs of history are everywhere. The town has much more than its share of monuments, markers, and historic districts. Here, it seems like the past is never far behind. Before there were cars, before there were trains or roads, long distance travel took place on water, and rivers were the highways. At Portage, by a quirk of nature, two of these river highways, the Fox and the Wisconsin, flow very close together. One of the things that's so remarkable about this location, which for many decades, centuries even, was called the Portage, is that it is one of the very few places in the North American continent where you can walk just 2,700 paces, a mile and a quarter, over flat ground, and by so doing, connect two of the most important watersheds of the eastern part of this continent so that you can travel from the Gulf of St. Lawrence all the way to the Gulf of Mexico simply by carrying a canoe across that very short, flat patch of ground. In 1673, the French explorers Marquette and Joliet passed through the portage on their way to the Mississippi River. If you stand on the bridge over the Fox River where State Highway 33 crosses that river, and then drive south toward the Wisconsin River on what looks to be a very, very ordinary suburban street past the fairgrounds in Portage. It doesn't look remarkable at all. It's only when you know that that was the route that in 1673 Marquette and Joliet crossed in order to link the St. Lawrence with the Mississippi and thereby discover for European historical purposes the great central river of, of North America, the Mississippi. It's only when you know that that you realize just how important this is. That suburban street is a footpath 10,000 years old. It is one of the most ancient corridors of human travel anywhere in North America. Because of its strategic location, Portage soon became a link in the international fur trade. Many Native American tribes passed through to trade, first with the French, then the British, and finally the Americans. The symbolic end of Native American control over the area took place at the Portage, when the Ho-Chunk chief Redbird, who was accused of attacking squatters on Ho-Chunk land, surrendered to the United States Army. The construction of a U.S. Army outpost, Fort Winnebago, soon followed. The fort guarded the Portage in the 1830s and became the core of the town which would grow up around it. By the end of the 1830s, Fort Winnebago had served its purpose. The fur trade was dying out and no longer needed protection, and the area's Indian tribes, through a series of treaties, were forced to give up most of their lands. In 1853, Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, who would go on to become President of the Confederate States during the Civil War, signed the papers ordering the sale of the fort that, as a young officer, he had helped to build. 
The buildings in all their glory really remain only in some elevation drawings that we do have from the U.S. War Department, paintings and a few other drawings. The buildings slowly, I think, disintegrated. There were a series of fires. And um, by 1866, the public was invited in to uh, take the rest of the building materials, remove everything from the site. Today on the Merlin Moore Farm, there are only a few reminders of the complex of fort buildings that once stood here. In 1926, when your grandfather took the farm over, there were no standing structures here. No. But there must have been foundations. And yeah, still so foundations in different spots. and places and that we have dug into and found them and and, uh, so. and the well which is that that central point on all of the drawings of the fort yes um, and that's here and we'll take you over and show that to you my grandfather built this platform here on top of it and uh, he's used it for quite a few years for the cattle all the cattle drank water out of it oh, have you ever been down there yourself oh yes a number of times <laughs> I bet it was hard to imagine what yes. the original builders had to go through to actually put yes, that it was something else. together. Quite a project, I would have thought. And how deep is this? 40 feet. It goes down 40 feet and it's about 8 or 10 feet across on top. <laughs> Isn't that something? And did you go down just to fix something? Yes. I mean, fix one of the yes, pipes put or... a belt on or something like that on the pump. Isn't that amazing? Why don't you tell me about these artifacts that have turned up? Well, these here, the musket balls that they used to fire, and we found some of them across, even down by the Fox River. This is a flint that goes along with them. That's what fired the powder to shoot the musket ball out. Oh, they're wonderful pieces. And this here is a U.S. military button. Well, that kind of nails it down, doesn't it? Yeah. And this little bottle here, my brother-in-law, he was here and we found That's part of it. It was busted in part. You can kind of see it was broke and we found both parts of it. Oh, that's amazing. That's a, that's a very early piece of yeah, glass. That's, really that's, a, that's remarkable. And this here is a big one cent piece. Ooh. And do you have a and date on this? That's back in 1834. 1834, oh my. This is a lock, must have been locked the people up in their jail or something. I don't know just exactly what they used it for. That's very remarkable. In 1866, when people were asked to come in, there were all kinds of buildings and barns and, and things. I mean, it was an incredible opportunity to have those building materials. I mean, there had been 200 men stationed here for a very long period of time working on elements of putting those buildings together and their foundations, and suddenly all those building materials, many of them that survived the fires, were becoming available, and that provided the grist for building a community, and that community survives. We're standing in front of a barn that is more than alleged to be part of uh, Fort Winnebago. Mr. Beam, David Beam, owned this farm. Mm -hmm. And one day him and his son drove by and drove in. And he wanted to know if we'd mind if he'd just look around and everything and look at the barn. And I, my folks says, well, sure, you know. And then he said to my folks, uh, did you know that this was part of the fort? We're on a farm. <laughs> in 1866, there was one complete building left standing at Fort Winnebago. And in all probability, this was, uh, this was the building. That would be a, a formidable size. Yes, it would be. Almost a three-story building yep. to take almost 10 miles. Mm -hmm. And you can see how well the roof at that has stood that, because that's all original up there. So those are the original cross pieces, mm -hmm. the original peg and beam architecture. Yep. The yep. You can see by the size of the boards even, that's original. It was moved 9.7 miles up what, according to drawings then, was the military road, but it was an Indian trail. And uh, there were two tracks superimposed on that from military wagons going from Fort Winnebago up to Green Bay. 
could have been moved by sleigh or it could have been uh, put on wheels. And there are deep notches cutting in these horizontal mm -hmm. members going all the way across. Um, do you have any knowledge as to how these were used? They had uh, beams or boards that fit in those notches, and then they laid the floor on top of that. And that's where the soldiers would sleep up above. It's been very, very wonderfully and lovingly preserved. And as boards have come off uh, the building, they've been saved. Um, the hardware has been saved. There is a, just a, an amazing amount of history, local history, that has been preserved here. And when you stand inside the building, um, it's an almost electrifying uh, feeling that uh, you get of history. This is the home of Zona Gale, which she built in 1906. Zona Gale was an only child. She and her parents lived here until they died and she married. Very grand on the outside, Greek Revival, as you can see from the two-story pillars, with the fan light in the attic gable, with the pilasters on either side of the house. I'm Judy Ulberg. I've lived in Portage, Wisconsin for 40 years. I've given architecture walking tours for 20. We have architecture starting with the Greek Revival style, you know, 1840s, up until right now, and we have everything in between. I am able to walk from my house on the river a block to a Queen Anne, two blocks to a bungalow, a block to American Forest Square. So yes, anything in the book we have on our streets in Portage. This is a great example of the Italianate style of architecture made of Portage brick. It is two stories, very imposing, and of course it's very high style. Portage brick is the cream colored brick that we have in many of our 19th century homes in Portage. And it's called uh, Portage brick because it came from the yellow clay from the river bottoms. We had three brickyards. This is the material that was used for most of the houses that were built, especially the high style houses, such as the one that we're talking about now, in the 19th century. But what I really want to call your attention to are the two bays. We have a one-story bay and a two-story bay. And these are angled bays going straight out and then back angling into the house. Also, there's wonderful brackets in this house and we have all sorts of wood detailing added to the Portage brick detailing. A Mr. Memhard built this house. We love Mr. Memhard in Portage, Wisconsin because he was a photographer and at the turn of the 20th century he went around and took pictures of buildings and so therefore we know what they looked like when they were built. For example, the porch on this house, this 1880s house, is a 1970s remodeling. The uh, wood, of course, had rotted, and so they took the picture that Mr. Memhard had taken and they reproduced the porch. This is the house of Sam Stotzer. Sam Stotzer was a worker in granite. He died 100 years ago today, but he left this as a monument to his artistry in working with granite. Uh, Sam Satzer learned the trade when he was very young. He worked on the William Tell grouping on the Minster at Basel, Switzerland. He worked on the main altar and the cathedral doors at the cathedral in Cologne, Germany. And he left this for us in Portage, Wisconsin. Sam Stotzer's house is a Victorian house and it's also known as a Romanesque house. Roman because it has Roman or round arches. You can see that in the porch entrance and please note those wonderful Montello granite pillars. Those would be the red granite that was taken from a town just north of here noted for its granite. Also the detailing around that Romanesque arch we have the squirrel, we have the owls, we have all sorts of decorative work done in granite that I think probably was done by Sam Stotzer himself. As with all old houses, we have little secrets. And this salamander is the secret of the Sam Stotzer house. 
Generally, it was considered an omen of good luck. And so that's probably why it's here instead of the date stone, which is generally put in this part of the uh, structure. Segmented arches, just like on that other house, remember? Except these have a ridge on it. See, I learn this stuff all the time. How wonderful is that? When I was a kid, that was, that was the best job there was, was the railroad job here. And my dad was an engineer and I wanted to be a fireman. I started out with a steam engine firing it and, and eventually I worked up to be an engineer. Yeah, I wanted to get on the road right out of high school. I graduated in 46 and I started on the railroad in 47. I went to service in 50 and got out in 52 and come right back on the road again. I worked between Milwaukee and the Twin Cities at the end, so I had it pretty much covered. Since its early days, Portage has been a transportation hub. As the city grew, a canal was dug alongside the old Portage Trail to move goods by steamboat between the Fox and Wisconsin rivers. And while the Wisconsin proved impossible to navigate, Tons of bulk cargo still traveled the canal east to the Fox and on to the Great Lakes. As railroads began to crisscross the state, Portage became a center of rail lines running north, south, east, and west. Frequent runs made it easy for people and freight to travel to bigger cities or nearby towns. Portage facilities included a roundhouse and maintenance shops. Running the trains and maintaining them provided hundreds of good-paying jobs and a line of work that, for many families, carried on from one generation to the next. A group of retired railroad workers, or rails as they call themselves, gathers every week in a local Portage restaurant to talk about the old days and the changes they've seen. I'm sure that the railroad employed more people than anything else in town. Right? In yeah. Early years, yes. Absolutely. And one thing about it, you had to be from a radio family to get on it one day. Oh, I had some very good friends that helped you. Not necessarily, George. Well, it helped. Well, it, it helped. helped. It helped. Yeah. My great grandpa was a section foreman at Camp Douglas. My grandpa was section foreman and helped made the steel between Portage and Milwaukee. My dad was an express agent, and I think I'm the last of the breed. My, my dad was real. My dad worked New Lisbon all his life, 1917. He retired in 1956. And my granddad was killed in 1890. They used to walk the top, and he dropped off at Sparta to get his raincoat. It was rare. Then it was walking the top back to the engine, and he swung around to get on the tank and he tried, got knocked off on the bridge east of Sparta and they found him hanging. Yeah, I, I, I come from a railroad family. Uh. There was a guy at the Dells and his dad was looking for a job for his son. And so his son come up and he's talking to me and he said, uh, can I get on the railroad? And I said, well, I just heard you're hiring. And I said, you might want to go down and, uh, and check it out. And he said, well, what is, what's the deal on it anyway? I said, well, you're going to have, probably have to work, like you might be called to go to work at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Or I said, you've got to work Saturdays and Sundays, no overtime. Holidays. And, and holidays, too. And, and another thing is that uh, you might get called and there might be snow that deep and you might have uh, something go wrong in the train and you've got to walk half the train length in snow that deep. Wait a minute, he says, stop right now. He says, I don't want that job. <laughs> and I don't know about these other guys, but when I hired out, I had to sign a paper that the railroad came first before church and family. My dad, if I can remember, I don't ever remember him as a, as a kid having a vacation. And we could work 16 hours back in them days. We used to be able to work 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Never get overtime until you were on that eight hours. This was Saturday, eight Sunday hours. was first eight hours was straight time. Straight time. 
we used to wait for people in lacrosse when they worked in lacrosse. We'd get up there and the rooming house would fill. You'd wait till somebody get out of bed, bed and get, so you called, could get in. <laughs> so you could crawl in. We went through an era from steam to power to diesel locomotives to updating of equipment and everything. We've seen it all. We were in that era that saw transition from a five-man crew down to a two-man crew, radio communications that we would never even thought of, and signaling and training uh, operations. We, we've seen it all, and we're very appreciative of being in that era. Hobo jungle was right down through here. But the hobos were never chased out of here because they never caused any trouble. They were guys out looking for work is what they during the depression. They were looking for work. And they, they would meet down here. We knew what their heartaches were because actually during the depression, we all went through the same thing. But we enjoyed coming here because they taught us something. They taught us to share things because they shared among everybody. Didn't make no difference. If, if you if you was a new hobo walking in, come on, sit down and eat and have a cup of coffee or something like that. There was a spring down here at one time, a beautiful spring, and they'd have a big pot. And I don't know if it was squirrels, rabbits, or whatever it was, but they'd put it in a pot with water. But us kids would go downtown and we knew where all the grocery stores were. And so we'd go out and back in the afternoons when the grocers got through throwing their, their old onions out and their old celeries and rutabagas. Now we'd take it all down here and they'd take the old parts off and clean it and make stew. And then they'd, sometimes they'd ask us if we were hungry. Well, us kids were always hungry during the depression. You know, you didn't have a lot of food at home. And they said, well, come on and eat. And they'd hand us this little pot. And what it was years ago, they had a sardine can about so big around and about that high and it opened up like this, uh, it rolled up. Well, those were clean. I mean to tell you, they, were, they had soap and water, they were clean, and they would take a ladle and they'd dump a stew in there or whatever they were cooking, and you'd sit there and eat with them as, as a kid. And uh, we'd listen, and I'll tell you, sometimes the stories you heard uh, of how the guy had to leave his little babies and that, kind of, it brought tears to your eyes, it really did, because they were, uh, they were, they were trying to make a living, an honest living, and they were doing it the only way they knew how at that time. So that was the hobo jungle. I sold bottles. I, I, we had a dump by our house, and you went down the gully, and there were all these bottles laying over, and I found these old guys that liked these bottles. And I eventually ran these guys out of money. They didn't have any more money. And so they said, well, you know, are you, are you interested in postcards? And I looked at them and I said, oh, well, these, these are neat. You know, these are interesting. So I, I started to collect all these different cards. And they were my town. You could, you could take my, you know, my paper out and I could go downtown and say, oh, look at this is what it used to look like. And that was exciting. And I took them to school and, and they were interesting. And then, then I became on the acquiring thing. Anytime I saw one, I got it. My dad was a photographer. He had this studio. And, and I saw that they were copying old pictures. And I said, oh, well, can I learn how to do that? And I could copy my own postcards. And so that's when I started in the darkroom here. I started doing the copied work. People would have a picture of the railroad or a picture of their dad's store or something like that. And I'd say, well, gosh, you know, if I can keep the negative, I won't charge you for it. And then sometimes I'd give them discounts on the prints and things like that. And, or, and then if they wanted the negative, I'd shoot two. So I had one for my file. And I probably have almost 3,000 images, I would say. and I printed them in a five by seven size and they fit nicely in my book. And, and this book is just about the canal. And it wasn't until people started to ask me, well, what, what's this picture of? 
And I go, oh, you know, that's the bank there. Well, what was next door? And I, go, oh, you know, I get my microscope on. I don't know, beehive. Oh, well, what was a beehive? Well, I don't know, you know. So then that started a whole nother thing. You know, all of a sudden you got all these pictures. Now you got to know what they are, you know. And, and so, I, you know, over the last 30 years, I've, you know, become kind of an authority. Not an, a really authority, but I know a lot of stuff about a lot of these pictures. In the next couple pictures, we're going to see uh, boats called the Wolf, uh, the Fox, and the Basketball. And these were the premise of the Portage Canal. 1876, our agricultural ability had kicked in here in central Wisconsin. And we had corn, and we had grains, and barleys. And our pricing was real poor here. Uh, the railroads were charging a lot of money to move goods. Yet out east, the pricing was really high because it was in, in such demand. So I think a lot of people don't realize how many millions of tons of grains and, and goods went into these small boats and then were transferred into larger Great Lake boats and taken out east. Used to take the show up to the nursing home. And before I did it uh, to a historical society or something like that, I'd go up to the nursing home and give this program. And really kind of a practice deal, not really thinking that I was gonna get a lot of uh, uh, feedback, but you'd sit up there and these guys would have fights with their canes, yelling at who's the, who was in this picture. Portage was a central post for all types of railroad repair. I mean, we had a roundhouse here where we did all the different steam engine repair, and we also had the track repair people here too. So uh, there's a lot of different pictures of people fixing the tracks. And some of the engines didn't fare so well after a while. They actually, you know, they were used quite hard. And, and one of the favorite pictures is the train wrecks and uh, when the boilers exploded. That, those were the biggest events, and they always had a postcard of that. Don't ask me. This is the M&P wreck down by Ryle. That was a big one. I think 87 were hurt. A lot of different wrecks. This one, the engine blew up, and it went into the canal. And the bad thing about that is that people got hurt. They Usually the engineer died and the fireman died in a situation like that. This is the, the Columbia County Fairgrounds and, and it's interesting to look at this and then go down to the fairgrounds because there's there were a lot of different livestock buildings and they were mostly uh, orientated to horses. Horses were the most valuable things. Cattle weren't worth anything. The horses are what you live by. I mean, they brought you to town. They, they took you wherever you were going to go. There were uh, lots of horse events. This was a picture of the horse racing and uh, um, this was the biggest thing going. And this is unusual, this is the chariots going around the racetrack down at the fairgrounds. It finally got utilized in a book. We did a book and so we got probably 400 of these images in, in a book and that, that's probably, the, you know, if you had the 10 best things you ever did in your life, that would probably be in my top 10. You know, I, I, that was a great great thing for me because I spent all this time and I finally got them somewhere where people can look at them. And so that's, that's good. That was why I did it, I think. I don't know why I did it. I have no idea. I think you can talk to anybody that collects stuff and they don't know why they collected that stuff, you know.